Hello there and welcome to the Drax Files Radio Hour Sansar Edition. My name is Draxter and I'm here in the Sansar studio in the basement. And today I have a very special guest, uh, a young up-and-coming author. Let's see, I wrote this copy myself. With, where's my copy? Uh, Lara Elena Donnelly. And I'm going to, uh, don't freak out folks, uh, I'm going to... Go to camera eight now, and you will see her in her avatar beauty. This is Lara. Hello, Lara. Hello. Uh, this is wild. This is the first time I have ever been in VR. Um, it's it's weird. You can feel your brain adjusting to being in this other environment. How do you, how does it feel? Does it feel a little uncomfortable? I mean, sometimes the headsets can be fairly they can be heavy. It does feel like my skull weighs about. 10 pounds more than it did before I put the headset on. <laughs> Can you wave to camera seven and, and let's, uh, let's look at your avatar because uh, we need to give props uh, where props are due. This avatar was made by Silas Merlin and it's based on a sketch of yours. So you're not only a sci-fi fantasy author, you're also a, uh, an artist or a visual artist, I should say. I would say I am a dilettante Oops. artist. Oh. A dilettante? Yeah, I I do like to do art. I often use it in my creative process. So I will do a lot of character sketches. Um, I don't do maps as much, which is a great disappointment to many people, I think. But I do a lot of character sketches. Uh, and so when you were asking what I would like my avatar to look like, I was like, I got this. I got it. I can handle this. Uh, this but yeah, so I do totally do a lot of art. This is so awesome. And I'm sorry for the viewers on YouTube and uh and Twitch, the camera is uh, designed by Granddad, and it's working really well. But I am operating the camera while I'm talking. So hello, camera gal over there. And I was just switching to camera three. Let's switch to camera three. Uh, here we go. Now, Lara, step a little bit closer to the microphone, please. All right, one step, second, because I am. Forward. I got to back up a little and then teleport myself down there. Oh, oh. is that how it works? Well, Interesting. Because there, there you go. go. Yeah, you're getting closer. That that's great. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's about as yeah, close yeah. as I can get without getting off of the edge of the map. No, this is good. This is good. We don't want you to get uh, off the edge of the map. And I'm wandering around like a crazy person. There's some interesting lag. So let's focus on the subject at hand, which is your writing. And um, you wrote a trilogy, and this is really interesting. This trilogy is set in a in an alternate universe. Let me grab one of the one of one of the books. The it's the Amberlow trilo trilogy. <laughs> this is uh, Armistice. Oops, this is which which uh, which one is that, this one? That one is book two. Book two. Where is book one? There's Where a is copy my of it right here on the table. Oh, okay, it looks you like it? you have. Amnesty. I don't know. I haven't practiced grabbing things. So I just <laughs> pulled it. Oh, yeah. There we go. There you go. Let's see. Let me go to camera six and uh, camera seven. Yeah, perfect. This is Amberlo. There you go. And Amberlo, White it. Amberlo <laughs> is in a alternate universe oh. or world that is very reminiscent to to me anyways, to the Weimar Republic. It's a, it's a city, Amberlo, where there is art, there is frivolity, there is, uh, um, you know, nightclubs and, and uh, dancing and, and relationships between, uh, between men and men. This is actually a, a, an incredibly romantic story as well. And then there is this one party party, a kind of a fascist thing, and they want to take everything over, and they do, and then there's revolution. And I enjoyed this book tremendously, and and uh, the 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 parallels to um, to the Weimar Republic and the rise of the fascist regime, uh, they they're perfectly interwoven with this with this fantastic 
other world, which which is um, not only reminiscent in this in the sort of subject matter and the plot, but it's also reminiscent in how people dress and sort of the technology that was around. My hard hitting question, Lara. Why the hell oh did you not just write? <laughs> did you get? We probably got this question asked before. Why didn't you just write sort of uh, uh, historical fiction set in the twenties, Lara? Why did you have to invent an entire world? Well, I think make it so of, hard on yourself. It's actually easier for me. Uh, part of it is that I came up in the fantasy genre, so I like that's what I was reading. That's what I always imagined myself writing. Um, mm-hmm. And also, it it kind of freed me up. I have an essay about this on Tor.com. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head what it's called because when you have a book coming out, part of having a book coming out is that your publicity team asks you to write about 10,000 blogs. So I don't oh remember God. which blog this was, but I had a blog about why an invented world instead of a historical setting. And it really let me have the aesthetics that I wanted to have. So like that very uh, art deco sort of early thirties, mid thirties aesthetic um, without, but also like it freed me up to do anything that I wanted to do geopolitically or like socially. So I could do things that, people might read in a historical novel and be like, yeah, but that's not how that really was. Um, Despite the fact, as you mentioned, that a lot of it is actually how it really was. Uh, But I could just sort of invent things without having to double check them or, I mean, it's kind of lazy. It's like, Oh, I didn't have to do a lot of research for this book, which is also a lie. (laughs) I did have to do a lot of research for this. I mean, you have to do world building. I think that's what people underestimate uh, in in order to just be coherent with, with, with sort of with your own setting, you do have to uh, do some world building and, and, uh, and make sure that, that people, um, operate coherently in, in that world with, with whatever the, the rules are that you're setting up, um, but but that is really that is really interesting. And 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 is is historical fiction? I mean, it can be quite. I think it's still kind of controversial. I mean, some people kind of still sort of scoff at it and go like, "Yeah, you know, we're just making stuff up, and that that is confusing the kids, and they don't know what's real anymore." Well, then they should do their own research. I mean, I think that's part of media oh. literacy is you can't read something and just assume that that's how it was. You mm-hmm. you have to read broadly, right? Especially if you're reading historical fiction. Like if it says title of novel, a novel, you know that it's fiction. So you can't mm-hmm. read it and be like, well, clearly this is fact. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Kate Wilhelm, who wrote this wonderful craft book called Storyteller, talks about doing your own research because novelists will like if you read a novel even if you assume that the most mundane things about this world are true like oh there's a street in san diego called like brown street i don't actually know if that's true but just for instance right like authors make up things like street names they make up things like towns they make up like you can't rely on a fiction author to tell you the truth at any point so you can never use somebody else's fiction as research for your own, you have to do your own real world research. Right. And uh, so you don't have a problem with, with that genre. We're wiggling. I just wanted to say, uh, folks on YouTube and Twitch, please get those questions ready. We're going to ask some questions. Hello, camera. And we're wiggling a little bit here uh, back and forth, which means that you are standing, right? You are standing, in, standing in the physical world. But good, I'm good, standing good. right on the edge of my map. Uh, I don't know ah. if that I can back up a little and then try to teleport myself back to the microphone. Oh, you can, if you walk back, I think two steps, then I think the, there you go. And now walk forward again. Ah, oh, this is just amazing to look at see, this avatar then I, walking. I end up right. So let me see if I can. Ooh, I want Ooh, to I just stand. see your shoes. Amazing. Double, Double to, ah, there we go. Laura has a uh, Laura has a handler over at Hop <laughs> Neo um, VR. Uh, Harry and we're super Harry grateful. Harry is that trying Harry, to help me here, and I'm Harry's like, helping. I don't know what's going on. So to no, teleport, no, no, it's all good. It's all I good. But tap. I don't think you have to you to teleport. You just, you can just walk forward, but not in the physical world. Just put the push the joystick button forward, and then 
and then uh, oh oh we'll there we go there okay so go. this is perfect thank you that's harry it. that's it and then harry sometimes is a ghost in vr you you can't see him but he's my mysterious ghostly helper so so this book is a trilogy and if you want to summarize uh if you were to to give me sort of an an an, an elevator pitch about what you wanted to write that that would really interest me because the romance between a um a, a super interesting flamboyant character who is a nightclub performer but also does a little bit of uh uh, illicit sort of dealing on the side and um, another guy who comes from a prominent family but is is also a spy um, and works for the government these the, the the romance here is at the center and you know my wife was asking me what are you reading there and I said well it's kind of a it's kind of a romance between these two men and there's a little bit of fascism on the rise around it. <laughs> so I, I wonder if you went to uh, to the publisher and said, like, I have a romance novel uh, and there's this other stuff. Or did you say I have a, I don't know, a fantastic alternate uh, history about political turmoil that can be tied into the present and there is a romance uh, on top of it. So, so how would you weigh these things? Um, and how, well, that's a related question. How do you pitch it? Or is there, is there, uh, uh, is one pitch more effective than, than, than the other? So I actually made neither of those pitches. Um, the first pitch that you mentioned, the romance novel, I've actually been pretty surprised to see this end up on some romance novel lists. Um, mm -hmm. cause it does have romance, but to me it is a spy thriller. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even really consider it alternate history because it's set in a secondary world. It's not set in our world or a version of our world. So when I pitched it, I pitched it as Cabaret meets John Le Carre. So like Tinker Taylor, Soldier Spy and Christopher Isherwood's uh, Berlin stories. Um, and I, I think I leaned much more heavily on the thriller aspect. And it's also really interesting to me, like when I wrote it, to me, the most fun part of it was writing the romance between Cyril and Aristide. But most people who read it really latch onto Cordelia, who is the third character, right. um, who has over the course of the story, like one of the bigger character arcs. Like Cyril and Aristide are very much people who the more they change, the more they stay the same. But she right. has this <laughs> she has this incredible development from like person who just wants to live her life to person who wants to change the world. And I didn't even mean to do that when I was writing, but a lot of people read it and were like, wow, what an amazing character arc. And I was like, wow, I'm, I'm uh, surprised that I managed to pull that off. So um, I guess I, I pitched it much more as a, like a political thriller um, that happened to have some sex and romance in it. It's really cool. I mean, these these two guys at the um, at the center, and then Cordelia, who becomes I don't know. I mean, we can we can spoil a little. I don't think it it spoils it too much. When I <laughs> should I or how do you feel about like spoiling things? Like, do you feel like no, 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 don't say anything? Like, so this Cordelia? is a discussion I have with my partner a lot because he's a screenwriter and he doesn't mind spoilers at all. He thinks mm -hmm. that it like spoilers should not affect the the quality of the story. But my argument is I want to experience a story the way that the author intended it at least right. the first time around. In sort uh, of a linear way and, you know, meaning you make decisions when to reveal what in, in the sequence of things. I see what Yeah, you're and, and then you get to, like, if it's a movie, right, you watch it and you're like, oh, wow, what a surprise. And then the second time you watch the movie, you know what's coming, which means that you get to enjoy the irony um, as someone who's already clued into the plot, but, uh, I don't know, go ahead and say what you're going to say. And I'll just, I'll just make my peace with it. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I don't want to, I don't want to force an opinion on you. I mean, the, the, the viewers and my friends know that I'm, I'm a hardcore ideologue when it comes to movies. I don't, I can't watch movies. This is a, se a separate subject a little bit, but I can't watch movies that are based on books because it destroys even if the movie's very well made, it destroys the the movie that I already have in my head from from, yeah. from reading it. Uh, I just was going to say that Cordelia, who you said uh, rightly, she's a super interesting character. She becomes an active 
revolutionary uh, out on the streets when the fascist party takes over. And that is an aspect that um, I think is really cool because the revolution is in the second part of the book and then the revolution is, is, is over and, and it's calming down a little bit, a bit and you didn't end there. You wrote a third book that deals with the aftermath. So it's, it's all, um, it's all in there. And, um, that's a, that's another really interesting thing. Why you could have stopped with, with a successful sort of revolution and left it sort of open, but you explored, uh, issues of, I don't know, you know, power vacuum and, and, and sort of turmoil afterwards. And especially the, the family aspect, um, uh, a, a child of of a, of a marriage that that had troubles uh, because of uh, uh, different ethnicities and, and 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 other things. See, now I don't want to spoil it, but I thought that that was also really really cool and really well observed. But why didn't you stop with um, when the revolution, when the Nazi the the Nazi stand in uh, party was defeated? Why did you I... want it to continue there? Why was this not the end for you? I think that it's disingenuous. So this is a story we see all the time, right? It's like bad guys take over, good guys defeat them. The end of the story is like, yes, now the bad guys have been defeated and we can go back to peace and harmony or whatever. Uh, And I think it's disingenuous to have the story end there because so often the end of any revolution, whether it's like a fascist coup or, you know, the resistance destroying a fascist party, like whatever happens after that, uh, it, that is actually quite important. So like if you, there's a book called Charlie Wilson's War, which is nonfiction that was made into a movie. Right. Um, and it's about the U.S. involvement in Afghanistan, like trying to shove the Soviets out. And the people who are really instrumental in this, after, after the coalition has like successfully gotten the Russians out of Afghanistan, the federal government in the United States stopped funding any of these activities. And the people who were involved in it were like, no, we have to stay involved because if we don't, uh, this will leave like a a power vacuum for, you know, people who we've seen who are ready to fill it that may not be, you know, I mean, in an imperialist sense, like the most advantageous people for the United States, but also just like, you know, we've gotten rid of the Soviets, but now there are religious, like violent religious extremists who are ready to fill that power vacuum. And so the people who were working to like fund the Mujahideen to help remove the Soviets were like, we have to stay involved. Otherwise this is going to come back and bite us in the butt. And then there was no money for it. So they didn't do it. And indeed it came back to bite us in the butt. So like looking at this, it was one of the, like I said, I did end up doing a bunch of research, even though these books don't take place in the real world. There are shapes of like, there are shapes of political movements and shapes of social movements and shapes of family dynamics that I sort of ported over from uh, the real world into this fictional one. So I did that, a bunch that of- is that that to me is so impressive. Uh, and, and, and it's, it's, it's good to know that you do this research because, uh, you know, and it's also depressing that there are shapes, which then suggests yeah. that we're just here to, I don't know, we're just little beach balls of some sort of other entity. People who are into intelligent design would say, well, it's God, of course. And we're just sort of repeating everything over and over and maybe, you know, until we figure I it mean, out. I wouldn't say that. I would just, like, I, I talked to my students about this. Sorry, what? I hear your voice is breaking up a little bit. Uh-oh. We have a new thing here. We have a, a, a machine uh, we have in the corner over there, no, on, on this side, we have a, a box of VHS tapes that is a magical VHS tape box that will bring us to a different world. I think where the voice is better, I'm told. I did my research, Lara. I did my research. Yes. I didn't realize that was going to make me jump up and down. That's very exciting. <laughs> Oh, no. Now I'm on the table. There we go. No, no, no. It's good. Oh, actually, the voice is coming back. Okay. Oh. So uh, just in case the voice gets really bad, we're going to jump into the magical VHS box and then uh, uh, and then we'll go from there. But I interrupted you. You were just talking about oh, yeah. uh, the research and you're talking to your students. Please also tell us where do you teach and what what is the context there? Who are these students? What are they trying to achieve? Uh, so I 
for the academic year 2018 to 2019, I was teaching as a guest lecturer at Sarah Lawrence in their Masters of Fine Arts program. So I was teaching master's students who were in the science fiction and fantasy track. Um, and I taught a craft class and then I taught a workshop and did a bunch of individual conferences. I'm going to be a thesis advisor for some of those students next year, starting in the fall or this year, I guess, starting in the fall. Uh, and I'm also teaching at the Catapult workshops in New York, which do workshops on site in Manhattan, but they also do online workshops. Um, so that's what I'm teaching. And the class I teach there is about taking on tropes in science fiction and fantasy. So I talk to them about, so one of the reasons that I really like to write in fantasy as opposed to writing historical fiction is this ability to uh, sort of isolate patterns so like I look around me and I'm like, okay, I see this particular pattern of social interaction or this particular pattern of oppression or this particular patter pattern of like a political movement. And instead of trying to faithfully recreate the details of those patterns, I can just take the shape of them and put them in fiction and fill them with something else um, mm -hmm. that I kind of have power to manipulate. Um, so... I, we, somehow we tied that into tropes in the tropes class. Who knows? Um, but no, this is fascinating. I mean, I'm I'm just always amazed when I talk to writers that you guys, uh, you know, when, you, when assuming you're good at what you're doing, you have this I ability hope so. to. <laughs> well, I think you you definitely are, and and people who come on this program, uh, you know, I don't I don't invite just uh, any you know any rabbit in a tuxedo lair. I mean, trust me. Uh, <laughs> But uh, that that you have the, this ability to 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 write about something that you don't necessarily have this personal um, uh, relationship with yet. For example, I mean, it, it, to my knowledge, you don't have children, uh, but I do, and so the relationship with between uh, with the boy in in, in book three, um, Cyril's uh, sister's boy, and uh, and his father and the, and the parents is. Is really spot on. I mean, this is really, really good writing. This could be, uh, this could be put into a play, as far as I'm concerned. Um, immediately. Maybe it's and because I'm I'm close enough to being 13 that I still remember how <laughs> like miserable it was. Um, yeah, that's the that's the. I, I tell my my wife sometimes asks me, "How old do you think you are?" And I said, "Well, I'm. I think internally I'm about 16, 17. <laughs> so you're 13. That's good." Yeah. God, I hope okay. not. I just am close <laughs> enough to remember. That that is what Erich Kästner once said, uh, German, uh, very important German writer, also for um, children's literature. Um, he said, if if people put their youth aside like an old hat, mm. um, and uh, but before I go off this tangent, I, I I wanted to ask you further about these about these sort of tropes, but does that mean then the, the danger of being formulaic? How do you, uh, what, what's your methodology in, in, in getting sort of the warning signs or being in tune with your own uh, warning system? You know, what, what, it, do, you, do you have that sort of, a, is that something that you develop or something tells you, wait a minute, you know, I'm now just replicating this thing uh, this trope, or I'm just sort of very schematically uh, following something that's been done a million times. So this is actually how I ended up developing my course for Catapult. Uh, I I had I kept giving this spiel to people, like when I was on panels, um, that I noticed I would start to do things in my writing. So like, there's a character in Amberlo, Ada Culpepper, who is the head of the intelligence agency. And when I first, like, when she first appeared in the book, she was, like, a middle-aged white man. And I wrote, like, a whole scene like that. And then I looked at it and went, why did I do that? I could have made her anyone. I've invented this world. I don't have to recreate the, I don't, like, I choose what power structures to recreate in my book. Why did I recreate this one? So I changed her to, like, a black woman who's the child of immigrants. And it actually really enriched the relationship that she has with Cyril, who is a white guy who's the son of a very privileged family, but she is his superior in this professional relationship. Right. So it made the story more interesting and complex. And then I started to ask myself every time I made a decision in my writing, 
why I had made that decision. So it mm -hmm. turned into uh, this thing that I tell my students I call conscious writing, where right. I, it's sort of like a constant interrogation of why I've made particular choices. Um, and also, I think the way that you tie it into tropes, because like it's impossible to but, write but something. Let, hold on, uh, uh, let okay. me jump in here because uh, this is super interesting. And let me guess, I mean, you probably came to the, the conclusion that there is a lot of popular culture that we're so inundated with that we, even if we're consciously uh, trying to create something that is uh, that is fresh, we, we, we cannot escape them. So that's that's yeah. fascinating that you uh, basically with this sort of self-discovery and and really uh, reflecting on on every decision that 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 you're making like why do you know let being brutally honest why did i make this choice right yeah. now is it really did it come from me or did it come from whatever netflix series i yeah, just yeah. i just watched mm -hmm. so the the way that i explain it to people in like example terms is if you've ever seen the casino royale james bond mm -hmm. movie with daniel craig there's a scene there's a couple scenes where people drown in that movie and they drown really fast. Uh, but in real life, it takes like four to six minutes of oxygen deprivation for brain damage and like seven minutes to kill someone. And you never see that like in any movie where anyone drowns. That's not how it happens. Or anytime someone has head trauma in fiction, they pass out and they wake up and they're fine when really you would have a concussion that would affect you for months. And this is just like on a small a small scale of like things we see in fiction over and over and over again and then replicate in our own fiction and it also goes big like sexism and racism and homophobia so like mm -hmm. it's a whole spectrum of things that you see over and over and over again uh that sort of reinforce this idea of what reality is or not even reality just like what what happens in a book or what happens in a movie um so yeah that's my that's my spiel well, this the, this is one of the things. I mean, again, this is this interview is not about me, but about uh, but about you. But since I was once diagnosed with mild narcissism, actually, that's not true. But I keep repeating that and see if people catch on with it. Uh, I would say that that's that what you're describing is also one of the main reasons why I just uh, I'm continuously quite bored with with popular uh, culture often, and uh, especially visual media, and I. I choose to uh, spend my free time uh, uh, reading. Although, of course, there is we had Tad Williams here, and and he was uh, making a very smart statement about the the fantasy market, where he says, you know, fantasy is a huge market. So inside that market, there will be garbage, uh, but there will also <laughs> be because by by sheer sort of output volume, and that doesn't mean that the genre itself. Uh, is is garbage, obviously, but uh, well, I mean, there's it... garbage in every genre. I had a I had a teacher at Clarion who, uh, to encourage us to submit to magazines, was like, uh, also he's from Long Island, so he was he was sort of like, you got to remember that like eighty five percent of everything is shit. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> 85% of everything that comes into magazines is shit. So you're already in the top 15%. But how do you know where just because they bought your stuff? I mean, how do you build that self-confidence that you think what you did? And I mean, you know, I'm, I, I, I enjoyed it. A lot of people enjoyed it. Um, although there's one guy on Goodreads who basically said, well, I didn't enjoy it. Which is which? I mean, actually, le leading me to uh, to uh, to my other question. Oops, why am I looking in this direction? I'm sorry. Here we go. Uh, is our rev reviews how important are reviews for you uh, or for for any writer in this day and age uh, on Goodreads on Amazon? Um, how crucial is this for the success of the book? But also, are you able to? Um, to, to compartmentalize that and, and put that sort of, uh, you know, a critique or, or even a, a vicious comment, does that, does that bring you down? Uh, hang on a second. I got my face kind of stuck in my mask. There we go. Um, I try, so I try not to read my reviews. Everyone tries not to read their reviews, but of course mm -hmm. you end up reading some of them. Uh, I don't know how to answer whether they're important to a book's success. I think that depends where the review is, who wrote it. A thing I have noticed is that often reviews in publications 
dedicated to reviews like Publishers Weekly or Kirkus uh, or or like Tor.com or, you know, places where reviews are published and read by a lot of people tend to not actually be reviews. They're just mm-hmm. kind of a summary of what happens in the book, which is nice because it means that you won't get panned, <laughs> which is, you know, you don't want to open Publishers Weekly and see someone being like, this book was garbage. Uh, but it's sort of disappointing that they're not actually reviewing the books. They're just summarizing them. Uh, people on Goodreads have no such stylistic compunction. Um, but I also think like Goodreads is important probably in a metric sense where like it's about clicks and ratings, but I, I'm actually not, I, I don't know. You'd have to ask my publicist how important mm. Goodreads is to the success of the book. Cause I have no idea. Well, that's one uh, Tom Hillenbrandt, who was a German author, uh, a friend of mine. He's a best-selling author f- with a, uh, a crime uh, series. He's really good stuff, but he also wrote an AR-based uh, thriller. And he uh, said that people look at Amazon reviews. They look at them and, you know, they say like, hey, I have uh, three minutes now, my lunch break, to decide what book I'm going to read on the train or uh, whatever. And then that that's that's sort of his assessment and they go through it and if 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 the first review says this is garbage then they they don't look any further they just go go to the next thing so it's it's this sort of um overwhelming amount of stuff that's out there uh i wonder i mean this is a related question that this is ne- not necessarily your job but how do you cut through the clutter i mean did you have a strategy that you put in your two cents with the publisher how to how to put that out there, how to frame it. I mean, you already framed it in your writing and the way the story is constructed is fairly unique, I would say. So that's a, that's a leg up in that, in that competition uh, to cut through the clutter. But um, what, what are some of the other methods there? I mean, this is, it's, it's crazy out there. So this and is why I really people like... People don't even read. People, people, people don't, don't have time even read. to read. Yeah. This is what I really like about being a traditionally published author as opposed to self-publishing is that I have a team, right? I have my agent and my editor. I have a publicist. I have the strength of the whole publishing company sort of behind me, depending on depending on how their budget shakes out, you know, that month. But I do have like other people who do this, um, which is really nice because I want to focus on writing my book. I don't really want to focus on analytics from Amazon. Um, I will say like the way that I choose books is not based on Amazon or Goodreads reviews, right? I choose books that people I trust to have similar tastes to me recommend. I will like look at a review if I'm buying a clothes steamer or a blender, right? Because I feel like (laughs) those have have things that like objectively need to work well. Uh, That's a good point. But with the book, I'm like, I don't really trust all these people on Amazon to understand what I am looking for in a book. So I I am much more likely to get a book recommendation from a sort of like-minded friend rather than looking at stars on Amazon or on Goodreads. I couldn't agree more because I always found it weird that people would sort of like uh, choose a book uh, because somebody wrote, yeah, it's really suspenseful and the dude is really hot and the girl is a little lame, but then, oh my God, they had this car crash and it sucks. So it's really, <laughs> it's just so, it's so arbitrary. Well, it's actually not arbitrary. I mean, this is how I guess Amazon is now constructing. Uh, actually, I saw a thing about, uh, what's his name? James Patterson. Um, oh yeah, was it James Patterson? Yeah, the the guy who just has two hundred thousand books. Eight million out. books. Yeah. yeah, there was a thing I saw on YouTube. It was recommended because I was watching a book review, and he was appearing on CBS this morning. And you see his, and this is actually really weird. I, I try not to get off too attention, but this is this is funny. Some of these super best selling authors, they have these shrines like Dan Brown. The same thing. They have these shrines devoted to them, right? So the CBS has this morning segment where they go into the homes of these best-selling authors. And, and three or four of them that I've seen, they have their own books on display. 
like multiple copies. I mean, I guess it's cool. I mean, they, they have four oh. translations, you know. I but, mean, yeah. I also have that shrine, but I think it's very much because you're proud of what you've done. And also your publisher sends you copies. And you're like, what do I do with them? I guess I'll just put them on this shelf. And every time I look at mine, I'm like, oh, yeah, I wrote those books. Go me. <laughs> Uh, so no, no, that, that, uh, listen, that is that is totally fine. That's total, I actually have posters of, of my films. And here, of course, even I have it in VR here, MeTube, our Sundance nominated uh, uh, video here. I even have it here in VR. Um, but there is a difference between putting a poster up or like, you know, a golden record, let's say, or a signed copy of something and, and building an entire room. <laughs> With copies of your books, Lara. Don't tell me that in your apartment you have an entire room with a li with a little cushion on the on the bottom where you sit. I mean, I live in New York, so I don't really have a space for an entire room. <laughs> um, but like, so I I once went to stay for a week uh, with like a friend of my mom's who we didn't realize at the time, but once we got there, it was a author of a famous book series of children's books. And mm -hmm. her house was, like, full of fan art that people had sent her, right? Because they're children's yeah, books. So, cool. like, yeah. kids draw these adorable things and send them to her. Um, she had the illustrations from her book, like, hung in her house. So, and that didn't feel weird to me because it was very much, like, this book influenced so many people. And it's a part, it's such a huge part of her life and such a huge part of all these other people's lives that it felt totally natural to be like, yeah, of course her house is full of dragons. <laughs> from her book. Like, that doesn't seem weird to me at all. Um, right, right. No, no, I mean, that that I totally agree. And the reason why I brought up James Patterson, by the way, was uh, was actually for the reason to, uh, to uh, in, in that piece, you, you see how it's impressive, how his operation is very methodical, and how he, I mean, this goes back to the whole trope thing. Uh, he has all these works in progress in these drawers, and it's meticulously organized. And and he talks about different sort of plot points and stuff like that. So you know, on, on I I can appreciate on a on on a level of of constructing these things, how how he does that and and admire the the engineering of things. And then at the same time, I feel okay. I mean, it's then it becomes very formulaic. And and but he probably works with data, or his team does. Uh, possibly through Amazon. I mean, we know that uh, with eBooks, you can, you can, you you have data that shows where people, uh, you know, skim or flip or flip to the next book or whatever. And that is, to me, honestly, uh, a terrible development when when fiction is then just also becoming this uh, commercial enterprise to just. Uh, cater to 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 whatever the needs are of people i mean it's the same with commercial classical radio to be honest i think it's it's terrible what's your what's your position on that um mm, wow i hadn't even thought about authors writing I guess writing to, specifically to for 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 the yeah or let's just let's just say writing um very commercially writing making choices that are either yours or your teams or your advisors or your editor says you you cut here or throw something in there because people and I'm, since your boyfriend were, uh, is writing for for TV I'm sure they're under much more uh, pressure like that if they're on on uh, on commercial TV they have to lead up to a uh, to a commercial break so they have to construct the drama around these you know they have to hit those points I guess that's uh it's a much harder um, thing to do, or it's more confined to 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 that to that format. So I'm actually not sure. I'm trying to think if I've heard of anyone doing this. I'm actually not sure that writing uh, writing to analytics or like writing using analytics is as much a thing as as we're sort of thinking about it in this conversation. I do know that like writing formulaically, uh, whether you're looking at the analytics or not is kind of a, a recipe for success. Like, if you look at the romance genre, uh, people who write romance make bank, even self-published, and especially self-published romance authors, because romance readers know exactly what they want from a romance novel. And so romance novelists can sort of turn them out very quickly because there's a very specific expected format. Um, and I don't think there's, right, like, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with 
writing formulaically, but I, I mean, it's not the way to write like a Pulitzer Prize winning novel, probably, but the readers are really satisfied when they read it. And the author is selling a lot of books and I hope enjoying their career as an author. So I think it's just like different levels of, it's what you want to achieve, right? Like what is your goal in writing books? Ah, Lara, now you bring out the elitist in me, uh, the elitist uh, reader uh, who was brought up by a literary snob and uh, and who then became, uh, as I'm approaching uh, 50 years old, uh, myself a snob, uh, I guess, because, but no, I mean, you're right, but I, I, I tend to uh, find these things a little bit uh, lacking and, and boring, to be honest, um, broadly so speaking. So you're not I mean, the we... target audience, right? Like, if you... Pick well, up an, a formulaic novel, and you're like, "Ugh, not for me." It's not. For I you. read, I I read Conan the Barbarian. I read pulp stuff. Like I was devouring this stuff. I was a big fan of Alistair MacLean and Robert Ludlum when I was a teenager. I have an entire shelf full of Alistair MacLean and then another shelf of Robert Ludlum, and I admire these people. I can't read it anymore because, uh, yeah, they 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 are formulaic and and the prose is a little bit lacking. By the way, your prose is is actually really good. And my mom at the time was saying like, "Why are you read this garbage? You know the the language is the the." the thing is the the language and i go like you know as a teenager no it's not the language it's the plot it's the explosions yeah. it's the it's the people dying and jumping up buildings and whatnot um of course so those those interests uh, shift but i would make the argument that some people if they're fed and i don't want to call any which genre any author garbage again but like if you eat mcdonald's five times a day for a large portion of your life, it's going to be very hard for you to appreciate a well-cooked, real food meal. That that, and I think that 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 could be the same for maybe reading. You know, if you're so used to these plot points and the formula, and you say, "Well, I like it," well, do you really, or have you not been exposed to other things, or is can't you even appreciate that? That's that's the question. My dad listens to Tchaikovsky all day always romantic period and i studied music and i was into contemporary classical 20th century really you know noisy stuff and to my dad that is garbage right mm -hmm. but to me that's uh super satisfying and interesting anyways <laughs> it's complicated uh. i think it's complicated is the answer <laughs> No, I think people need to go into my uh, 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 communist uh, one-party state where <laughs> they uh, have to listen to certain types of music and uh, read certain types of books so they, they, can, uh, they can grow. <laughs> All right, that killed the room. Um, <laughs> are you doing good in VR? We have 15 minutes on the I know it's, it, can be, it can be quite exhausting uh, with, with, with the headset, but, but you're doing okay? doing okay the headset is getting a little bit heavy but if we've only got 15 minutes left i think i can survive now you said uh you have a team and uh you're published uh, with tor tor is a big publisher sci-fi fantasy um now uh the self-publishing route includes certain freedoms it also includes uh the anxiety of having to do your own marketing and, and that kind of stuff how hard is it to get a publisher and are you rolling in dough? Huh. Two, two questions. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't actually think it's that hard to get a publisher. Uh, debut novels are much easier to sell than I think people would kind of have you believe. I mean, there's still a pain in the butt to try to sell. Um, but everyone I've talked to, it's like the debut novel is easier to write than the second novel if the debut novel doesn't do well, it's much harder to sell a second novel. Um, but like there are thousands of debut novels getting published every year. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do think it's that, that is hard. an incredible that, that's an incredibly good point. So you're basically saying that a debut novel, P, the publish, publishers are willing to to take a risk. Of course, then it, if it doesn't sell, then you're then you're out. But you should. As an aspiring writer, if you feel good about your material, you should approach them, right? Because, because. Well, the... you shouldn't approach the. I mean, you could approach the publisher directly. Uh, Lord knows, I met my oh, editor. An agent. Yeah, before I had an agent, but ideally, you'll have an agent do the approaching for you. 
Mm -hmm. No, no, that's what I meant. That's what I meant, uh, and Adrian. But what I mean is that the, the this is really this is really interesting. So the publishers they just push their stuff out, and then they see what sticks. And then, of course, the the follow up and building a career from it is really the hard part, but not necessarily the first one out of the gate. Right, right. And I'm actually in a really interesting place right now because I have this trilogy. So we thought that the first one was going to be a standalone and then it ended up becoming a trilogy. Now the trilogy is out, which means I have three books out, but they're all sort of in the same milieu. Um, and now, now we're sort of like, well, what happens next? Um, and I don't know. We have a lot of things up in the air right now. So it's a weird position to be in. It's a cool position to be in because the books did well enough that my publisher is still interested in publishing more things that I've written. We just don't know what those are yet. <laughs> uh, was, you, oh, the second part of this was, am I rolling in dough? Well, no. I think that's, um, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm asking that because I think people uh, look at uh, published authors or also uh, at musicians often, uh, even musicians who, who sell uh, as if they are, um, you know, you know, set for life and they're just uh, buying houses and cars and all that. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> You know what's what's the what's the reality here for the kids at home who want to uh, who want to have a career like that? Don't quit your day job. <laughs> Don't quit your day job. Though it is really cool if you start publishing and you can manage to work full time and write books. It really puts you in a nice financial position where you know twice a year or once a year you're like, oh, here's a bunch of money to stuff in my retirement account or like pay down some debt or make a down payment on a house. But when you are only writing, which is what I'm doing right now, uh, it turns into this game of like, okay, if I sell a book for this much and the way that the contract breaks down the payments, my payment will be spread over this much amount of time. Um, and like, they'll be decreasing as I get them. And so you start like doing these weird mathematics where you're like, how long can I survive on this book? And how many more books do I need to write? And what other side hustles do I need to curate? So like, I'm teaching right now. I'm doing the thesis advising at Sarah Lawrence. I'm an independent writing coach. Like people can hire me to be their, their coach one-on-one -on -one for their writing. Uh, and I'm still looking for a full-time job. So <laughs> I am it, like you, publishing three books does not JK Rowling make. Yeah, this is, this is, I think really, really, uh, uh a super important reality check and you know i'm i'm a broken record on that too i think that should uh not prevent you from pursuing uh pursuing the the the, the creative life but you you should be realistic and and and, and uh, smart about that now when you have a, a a day job is that you know i i always have this picture of roald dahl roald dahl uh when it was his uh his birthday there was a there was a tweet from the bbc and it showed a little clip of royal doll you know famous uh, british uh i guess today you would call him young adult author charlie and the chocolate factory and such uh he has this routine every morning he walks into this um little garden shed and then he puts the blanket on him and then uh he has this pad of paper and then he writes so he has this routine it's very solitary uh, his wife and other people are still in the main house, but he's sort of uh, separated like that. How does this, how can you create in sort of the madness of everyday life, if you have a day job and then, you know, students can be rewarding, but they can also be draining energy, I suppose. Uh, how do you find these little islands of um, of solitude that you need to uh, to write something you know, that is longer than a newspaper article. I mean, it was, you know, it's different than when you work in sort of news, daily news and, and, and write a book. I mean, it's the same difference between daily television or even even a showrunner, but in, in, in a movie, those are just different forms that require longer periods of, of being with yourself and sort of have these ideas sort of work, work through. So I usually sit down at like 8 p.m., which I have found to be my... In like the it accidentally, evening, that's when I go to bed. That's crazy. Okay. It accidentally became my habitual writing time. And it's kind of annoying because if I want to do anything at night, I end up losing my writing time. Uh, but when I was working, so I used to have a job where I worked from home. And that was great because I didn't have commute time. And I could just knock off work, cook dinner, and then go to writing. Uh, when I was working in an office in Midtown, 
the only thing, honestly, that got me through finishing Amnesty, which is the third book in the trilogy, is that I was contractually obligated to turn it in. Uh, and I would go to work, work all day in a very stressful customer service job. Oh I would God. come, yeah, and I would come home, eat whatever was in the refrigerator, and then type for hours until like 10 or 11, go to bed, wake up at 6.30, go to work, come back, eat what was in the fridge, type. Uh, and I somehow survived. And as soon as Sarah Lawrence offered me the guest lectureship, I was like, I'm done. <laughs> I can't do this anymore. I will find some other full-time job. Uh, and then they offered me another semester of guest lectureship. And then I sort of was like, oh, I can kind of relax on finding a full-time job. But now that the lectureship is done, I have to go back to looking for salaried work with health insurance. So uh, that's where I'm at right now. It's like, well, I've survived as an author for about nine months. And now it's time to think about going back into the workforce. <laughs> but I think it, that, that gives you a little bit peace of mind. I mean, I'm, I'm really impressed with that because it, it, it is really hard uh, to, to creating the, the, those islands of, of, of peace where, you're, where you can focus. And when you just mentioned, uh, you know, I don't, we don't need any specifics, but customer service uh, positions can be, uh, <laughs> can be fairly stressful. draining. Yeah. yeah, yeah. People yell at you all day long. Um, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's amazing that you were able to 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 finish that that book. I uh, my hat is off to you. That that that's amazing. Thank you. Now, uh, as we're we're closing out the hour, um, uh, Daisy is not watching. I was just looking. Daisy is a friend of mine and a published author and a member of our book club. She has uh, often very good questions, and the question that she often asks, uh, you kind of answered, which is self-publishing versus uh versus versus having publishers or which route to go so um i wanted to ask you about the question fantasy versus sci-fi I, I had uh, a contentious uh throwing back and forth with um argument isn't it interesting we have all the knowledge in the world on the internet and what do we do with it we argue with people who we barely know about stuff that yeah. is completely irrelevant of course um, some people say, you know, fantasy, you know, pure escapism, kind of BS, but sci-fi, that's really where it's at because sci-fi is exploring ideas. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of uh, expanding our mind. Um, what, where do you, is, is that something that you, discussions that you have where, where people dismiss fantasy sort of as a whole, as a, as a genre of, I'm talking specifically in terms of, of validity in exploring ideas. I mean, with your trilogy, you explore authoritarianism and, you know, we, we, we live in, an, in, a, in, a, in a pretty scary age, in, uh, not only in the US, but in, in the world. And so I think that that's one of the aspects why I think your trilogy is incredibly timely to explore these in this alternate universe. But uh, do you think um, there is something this argument that sci-fi is more valid than fantasy i hmm, i don't uh because so the the one argument that gets bandied around the internet which i'm not sure i'm like 100 percent on board with but neil gaiman gave this sort of famous speech or wrote a blog or something where he talks about fantasy being uh if it is escapism it is the dream that you have that allows you to come back to the world sort of refreshed, like that fantasy teaches us how to fight the dragons in our real life. And like, that's cute. Uh, but I think fantasy, so like sci-fi allows you to take a, like a supposition, right? Like what if this was true about our world? Um, and like, what are the implications of this scientific development or, or whatever, right? Uh, and then do sort of a, like a moral exploration of that. And I honestly think And fantasy... also moral exploration of how human relationships would pan out in the exactly. future with like uh, juxtaposing a certain technology that would change relationships and such, yeah. Yeah, that's like the meat and potatoes of science fiction. Um, and Ted Chang does this really well. Like he's famous for how does uh, scientific supposition like influence the way people interact with each other. But I honestly think that fantasy does exactly the same thing. It's just mm -hmm. that the suppositions that fantasy makes aren't necessarily ones that could come true in our world. Um, and then there are people who are like, well, any science fiction that includes faster than light travel is really fantasy. Um, but I think like 
all speculative work kind of does this thing where it's really about, I mean, like good speculative work does this thing where it's really about character and you're exploring the characters through your speculative element. Right. And ideally, like, I, so I hesitate to say, like, that uh, if you could tell a story without its speculative element, that you shouldn't make it speculative. But what I really like to see, because um, I think, like, if you want to write a story with wizards or whatever, go ahead, write a story with wizards if that's your jam. But what I really like to see in speculative fiction is when the speculative element, whether it's science fiction or fantastical, is in some way like integral to whatever it is that the story is trying to say. So whether it actually moves the plot or directly influences the character, I don't care so much as long as it is like resonant with the, with the heart of the story. That is a really good point. And uh, basically you're saying that the humanity and uh, the, the relationships between human beings. I mean, that's what I would say when people say, why do you even read, you know, uh, as a reader, why don't you watch more television? Uh, I would say the exploration of humanity, uh, the exploration of of relationships, and then learning more about myself. If I read Kafka or if I read you, um, it's it's essentially the same. It's different viewpoints, and people explore the human condition. And if it's on a spaceship with Captain Picard, or uh, if it's a Gregor Samsa turning into a bug. Uh, it's 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 the same it's the same thing, yeah. So uh, last question, um, and actually in front of you is the book by uh, Ebony uh, Thomas. Here, let me grab this and put it into the because she is coming and she's ex. Oh God, I'm dropping these books here. I apologize. Let's grab this one here. This is Stanley Chen, The Waste Tide, exploring um, exploring. Uh, pollution and uh, issues of pollution. Oops, I dropped that one too. Okay, I give up. Lara, last question. Are you going to write about dragons? I think I lost her. Lara, hello. Are you still there? Oh, Lara disappeared right at the at the top of the hour. Maybe the timer went out. Uh, anyways, folks, then I think we can wrap this, the program. Thank you so much for watching. And check out a the Amberlo Trilogy, Lara Elena Donnelly. I think it's laradonnelly.com. The Amberlo Trilogy, uh, immensely satisfying. Next week, and we see it here on, on the camera, this book right here in front. Let me grab it. This is Ksenia Anske, and I still don't know if I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Ksenia Anske will be here in studio one week from today. Have a fabulous day, folks, and Dragster out. Thanks for watching. <laughs>